Welcome back to Student to Stud. Today, we're going to go over a basic trauma case of the upper extremity, talking specifically about the clavicle. Here's an outline of what we're going to be talking today. We're starting off with a case presentation. Say you get called from the emergency department, they tell you that you have a 37-year-old male that fell onto his left shoulder while playing football with some buddies. The resident asks you to pull out the x-rays and ask you to tell him what you see. So, what do you see in this x-ray? You would say you have one view of the left shoulder in a skeletally mature individual demonstrating a left mid-shaft clavicle fracture that is completely displaced and significantly short. Now the next step is knowing what you have to do in the emergency department, what's expected for surgical indications and non-operative indications, and what you're going to do and expect to see on a history and physical. So let's go over that first. Let's see what a typical history and physical exam of a clavicle fracture will entail. You have to know pertinent anatomy. The first interesting fact about the clavicle is that it's actually the first bone to ossify. And this happens in the fifth week of gestation. And it's actually the last ossification center to fuse. That's between 20 and 25 years old and is typically at the sternal end. The coracoclavicular ligaments, which is your superior and inferior stability, are very important. First, there's the trapezoid. It's located about three centimeters from the tip of the acromion. And then there's the conoid. Remember that the conoid is closest to the core and it's located about four and a half centimeters. So here's a visual representation of this, of the humerus, the scapula, and the overlying clavicle and associated ligaments. So you have your acromioclavicular ligament, which stabilizes the AC joint. And then you have your coracoacromial ligament, and then, as you can see, the conoid and trapezoid ligaments, which make up the coracoclavicular ligaments. Next are the deforming forces of what causes the fracture patterns to do what they do during a fracture and what you see. So you have your sternocleidomastoid and your trapezius, which are going to be pulling the fragments and deforming them in a superior and medial direction, creating a typical pattern of having an apex superior. Now, you also have sternoclavicular ligaments holding the medial fragment medially. Then you have your pectoralis and latissimus pulling the fracture fragments more inferiorly and medially. And lastly, you have the weight of the arm pulling the lateral fragment inferiorly. So it's very important to know these deforming forces and it, because it can tell you a story of how the fracture is going to displace and what it's most commonly going to do. And this is also important in surgery when you're trying to fight these forces and putting the fracture back where it needs to be. So what's a typical presentation? The typical patient that is going to present with a clavicle fracture is going to be a male, somewhere between the ages of 10 and 30 years old, although it's not uncommon for them to be older or younger than this. The fracture most common will be in the middle third, but it is not uncommon to see fractures in the lateral third as well. The mechanism of injury is usually dictated by age. In adolescents and adults, these mechanisms is going to be a moderate to high energy, such as a motor vehicle accident, fall from height, or a sports injury. Whereas if it is an elderly patient, they may have had a fall from a standing height onto their shoulder and cause the fracture. Now comes your physical exam. The patient will likely be supporting the injured extremity. You look to see the integrity of the skin. You will likely see ecchymosis and deformity. Having an open clavicle fracture is very rare, but you may see tenting in the skin, which is caused by one of the sharp fragment ends poking through the overlying muscle and creating a tent effect of the skin. Although rare, this is important because tenting of the skin could theoretically cause skin necrosis to the area due to pressure. If the patient is having shortness of breath, you'll want to evaluate for a possible pneumothorax or hemothorax. It's unlikely the patient would have a pneumothorax from a clavicle fracture than from direct chest wall trauma, but still, you should auscultate and look at chest x-rays if you're suspicious. Lastly, you'll want to evaluate distal pulses, cap refill, color of the skin, as well as neurological status, because there are some very important structures that run intimately close to the clavicle, such as the subclavian artery and vein and the brachial plexus. Next, we will go over some imaging that you'll want to get for the typical clavicle fracture. The ED will typically order standard radiographs for the shoulder, AP chest, and sometimes specific clavicle radiographs. So you'll have an upright of both shoulders. Now, there's also a 
view called the Zanka view. This is when there's a 15 degree cephalic tilt to the actual radiographic machine. And this view can be helpful to determine superior and inferior displacement of the fracture and if there's any intraarticular involvement into the AC joint. Knowing different views of the radiographs in different names is pretty high yield. And I would especially remember this one as AC joint pathology as well as clavicle fractures are quite common. In AP chest, we'll get x-rays of the clavicles bilaterally, which are always good to compare their normal anatomy to the fracture pattern. Lastly is a CT scan. The majority of the time you will not order one of these, but they may help evaluate displacement, shortening, comminution, articular extension, vascular injury, or if it is a previous injury, then an, the extent of non-union. All right, now onto the all-important classification system. There are two primary classification systems for clavicle fractures. The original was the Allman classification that broke it down basically from most to least common into group one through three, going from mid-shaft to lateral to medial. Further subclassifying clavicle fractures when the fracture is located distally is the near classification. Type one is going to be located lateral to those CC ligaments we talked about earlier. Type two is going to be broken down into A and B, but both of these are going to be superior displacement of the proximal fragment. But, but depending where the fracture is and what is torn is going to give us the type. A is going to be medial to the CC ligaments and B is going to involve the ligaments. Now B1 is just one ligament torn and for us to have proximal fragment displacement then the only ligament that can tear to give us the pattern is the one located more medially, the conoid ligament, the one that's located near the core. Then there is the B2, where the fracture is lateral to the ligaments, but both of the ligaments are torn, so we will get that same fracture pattern of medial displacement. Next is type 3, which is intraarticular. Type 4 is in pediatric patients when it involves the physis. And lastly, type 5 is a comminuted pattern. Now let's see what are some indications for treatment. So this was our original case presentation of the mid-shaft clavicle fracture that's completely displaced and very shortened. But what are the absolute and relative indications of taking a person to surgery? Every fracture you see should go through the same algorithm in your head when determining how you're going to treat it. You have this x-ray. Now let's go to the next slide and discuss treatment indications for clavicle fractures. Every fracture you see, you should go through the same algorithm in your head when determining how you're going to treat it. So let's go back to our first case. You have this x-ray which shows one view of the left shoulder and a skeletally mature individual demonstrating a left mid-shaft clavicle fracture that is completely displaced and significantly shortened. The next question you'll be asked, how are you going to treat this? The first part of every algorithm is, is this going to be non-operative or operative? To answer this, you have to look at the indications and tolerances for, of the fracture. Clavicle fractures are quite controversial within the orthopedic field. There are absolute indications and then there are the relative indications that some would treat operatively where others would treat them non-operatively. It is important to know that you know the absolute indications because these are the ones that are definitely going to be going to the OR. So what are the absolute indications? They are open fractures, which are rare for clavicle fractures, displaced fractures that cause skin tenting. We take these to the OR because remember the tenting of the skin can cause skin necrosis subclavian artery or vein injury, floating shoulder, which is when you have an ipsilateral clavicle fracture plus a glenoid neck fracture, symptomatic non-unions and symptomatic malunions. So what are those controversial indications? Well, if it's an unstable fracture pattern, like a near type two and two B, as well as five, displaced with greater than two centimeters of shortening, which we have on the case on the left, bilateral displaced clavicle fractures, brachial plexus injuries, closed head injuries, if they have a seizure disorder because they're prone to falling, and if they're prone to falling, then they may not heal this correctly, and polytraumas. Now let's go on to the different treatment modalities. Non-operative treatment. So you can put this patient in a sling. Now you may have heard of a figure eight brace. A figure of eight brace is essentially one that wraps around both clavicles and wraps around the back of the person. Now, in studies, they've been shown that the sling and figure eight brace have equal outcomes for both cosmetic and fracture healing. And the typical pro protocol for these is gentle range of motion at two to four weeks and then strengthening at six to ten weeks. 
Now, if you're going to take them to the OR, what can we do? Well, there are three mainstays for open reduction internal fixation. There's superior plating, antero-inferior plating, and using a hook plate. Superior plating is going to be biomechanically superior, but there's going to be more hardware irritation. Antero-inferior plating is not as biomechanically strong, but there's less hardware irritation. And then there's the hook plate. The hook plate, these are indicated for distal third fractures where there's insufficient bone for a traditional plate. Now, what are you going to do postoperatively? Range of motion will begin at one to two weeks, strengthening at six weeks, and then back to full activity at three to six months. So even though this patient's going to go to surgery, they're still going to have to recover. So that's a discussion that you have to have with the patient, whether they want to have operative versus non-operative treatment, if they get the option. So here's an example of a superior plating. All right, what is the surgical approach? There's really one approach to the clavicle, and that is a straight anterior superior approach centered over the fracture. When you're making your dissection, the first muscle, muscle that's encountered is the platysma. Do you know what nerve innervates this muscle? It's the cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve. Once you get through the platysma, there are going to be multiple small supraclavicular nerves. These can be attempted to be salvaged, especially in women, as this can cause an area of numbness around where the bra strap is, and this can be somewhat irritating. And then you also have to be aware that the subclavian artery, vein, and brachial plexus run very intimately. Within five millimeters in some studies, the subclavian artery is due to the relation of the clavicle. So when you're drilling from superior to inferior, you cannot plunge because you may hit the subclavian artery and either cause a bleed or a thrombosis. Typically, there are three bicortical screws on each side of the fracture. And postoperatively, you may want to get a chest x-ray just to rule out a pneumothorax if the patient's having some trouble breathing after the case. So potential complications in clavicle fractures, non-unions. You want to consider a surgical intervention after nine months. You want to ask a patient if they're having any pain, as this can be an absolute indication where you'd go back in and do open reduction internal fixation with or without bone grafting. Malunion, now these are defined as if it's shortened greater than three centimeters, angulated greater than 30 degrees, and translated greater than a centimeter. You can remember this with the SAT mnemonic. You want to treat this with a clavicle osteotomy of bone grafting. Hardware irritation, especially in the superior plating with 30% of the patients having hardware irritation, adhesive capsulitis in their shoulder, and then neurovascular injury, superior plating more commonly than anterior plating. All right, let's go over some PIM questions that are high yield for clavicles. How far immediately is the trapezoid ligament? Three centimeters. How far is the conoid? Four and a half centimeters. What nerve innervates the platysma? facial nerve, or cranial nerve 7. What is the major deforming force to the medial segment of a middle one-third clavicle fracture? Sternocleinomastoid. What is the classification for distal one-third clavicle fractures? Near. What nerve is at risk with the anterior approach to the clavicle? Supraclavicular nerves. What is a special radiographic view for the clavicle? Zenka. In the almond classification, what group is the most common? Group one, middle. What is a common complaint most operatively when a plate is used to fix a clavicle fracture? Hardware irritation. Define a floating shoulder. Ipsilateral clavicle fractures plus a glenoid neck fracture. Name some operative indications to fix a clavicle fracture. Open, skin tenting, neurovascular injury, floating shoulders greater than 2 centimeters with displacement, symptomatic non-union or malunions. What kind of stability do the CC ligaments provide? Superior or inferior? What plate is mechanically stronger, anterior or inferior or superior? Superior. After ORIF, the clavicle, what imaging studies should you obtain? Why? Chest x-ray to help rule out a pneumothorax. What physical exam finding would be an operative indication? Open or skin tenting? I hope you enjoyed this lecture and make sure to check out our other lecture series for, for some high yield cases and some high yield learning. See you next time.